My brothers, peace of the Lord. We have already welcomed everybody in Brazil, and now we are also connected to some locations and countries abroad. So, we greet the brethren and add that today is a busy day. We are taking advantage of this day to bring knowledge to all pastors, workers, and Sunday school teachers regarding the moment we are living in. We need to understand the doctrinal essence necessary for the time that we are living in. Today we will get to know some of this doctrine. A doctrine which has been throughout all times, eras, and has reached us today in the time that we live in. It is necessary for us to understand some of the characteristics of this doctrine, which is essential for our times. The church can only master this doctrine if they are ahead of the times. When she is able to discern and be ahead of God's project for the world, the times we live in are both a historical and prophetic moment. We are now living the final era, a period which is approximating 2,000 years after the outpour of the Holy Spirit in the Pentecost. We are now awaiting the outcome of God's project for His Church. The world will continue on, but the Church will be withdrawn, will be raptured. That is why it's important for us to discern this final moment, as seen in the book of Revelations, a book which reveals to us the history of the Church and its final moments, which leads us now to study the judgments. We are going to anticipate here today a subject that is related to God's judgments over everything that is programmed for this time. Some of these judgments, they have already started. We will see that the church is living part of this era of judgments. In fact, the judgments that will come later on with all intensity the church will no longer be upon the face of this earth, but rather raptured. Now, something I would like the brothers to take heed is to the sequence. At the first moment, the church will rise in the rapture. The bride will be raptured. There will be a period of great tribulation over those here on the earth. And later, the bride which had been raptured, which will now be the wife, the church, shall descend with Christ during the second moment. At that time, Jesus shall not come for the saints, but now with the saints to establish the millennium of peace. That is why the great concern today, when we hear news regarding Jerusalem, note that Jerusalem shall be and is the stage of all historical and prophetic events of the world. When you see Jerusalem, you see a city of little physical value, however of great spiritual, religious, and cultural value. It has been the center of a cultural and religious global dispute between Jews, Christians, and Muslims, all of which want Jerusalem because each one of them feels the city belongs to them. So, the whole dispute is around Jerusalem. Any arising agreement regarding Jerusalem shall be made in times where the church will no longer be present. It will be a period called the Great Tribulation. The church will be raptured. The world shall remain Israel shall remain here because they did not accept Jesus. Israel will find itself surrounded, and the world is all against it. We are talking now about a political Israel, the spiritual Israel. We recognize its destiny in the Word of God. However, the physical Israel will be at the center of this political dispute regarding the rights to the land, being disputed by Arabs, Jews, and Muslims. However, it is not of any importance to us 
What is important for us to note is that at that time, the church will be raptured. There will be a great tribulation. We see in the book of Revelation, the prophetic aspect of the church lives today. As seen in the church of Philadelphia, what does it say? Behold, I shall soon come. We are living this time. It is the last letter. Behold, I am at the door and knock. It's a letter which shows us how close we are to this moment. We see when someone writes to you a letter saying that soon they shall come to visit you. They are practically at the door. It means somebody is waiting. It can happen at any time. This serves to us as a warning. When you least expect it, suddenly someone hits at the door of your house. The church is living this moment of expectation. The last moment, the moment has come for us to leave. A moment in which the church and every believer needs to understand and discern. This moment, the prophetic moment, a moment which we need to be ready and not careless. For the word of God says that two shall be in the field, one shall be raptured and one shall remain. When we least expect it, it will be like the blink of an eye. The world will be completely unaware, just like it was in the days of Noah. The world was unaware. Not only were they, not un they were unaware, but they did not hear what was prophetically being announced, nor were they ready. The whole world perished, and only Noah's family survived. God was the one who closed the door of the Ark of Noah. The same way, brethren, God will close the door in this last moment, the door of grace. This door is prophetic, and the door will close. We see in the book of Revelation, in the last letter to the church of Philadelphia, the one who has the key, the key of David, like it was in Israel when the door was opened and all were called, it closed. It shall be with us too, but this time the prophetic door, the door of grace, which is opened now, shall close. When exactly will it close? We are not concerned. For each and every one of us individually needs to be cognizant and ready of the times which we live in. We need to be prepared. Today we will show the brethren the aspects of a prophetic moment. Everyone likes to study prophecies, to learn something new. Today, something new will be shared. Those who are here, those who are listening to this class, these will be a set of important classes. Not only this class, for this one only barely scratches the surface. But for us to be aware of the world and moment which we live in. If you are watching television, or if you're watching the news, or listening to radio, you can start to clearly understand and see the unfolding of situations which precede a great happen happening. A happening which is about to occur. This is the concern here today in this class. It is the following. The church needs to be ready for the days are counted the judgments of God are being executed so the church as seen in the seven churches in the book of Revelation we see that everything that happened to each church speaks about a moment in which the church lived in the last two churches the church of Laodicea and the church of Philadelphia talk about the moments that we live today this is the subject we will cover today we are living and are about to live the moments which precede this great happening. When the church leaves, a chain reaction will unfold the great tribulation, and the church will no longer be here. As we study the last letter in the book of Revelation, driven towards the church of Philadelphia, the Lord says, 
because you have kept the word, I will also keep thee from the hour of trial, which shall come upon all the world. This is a promise for the church. We shall not go through it. Why? Because our suffering and persecutions the church has gone through since the day of Pentecost. If we analyze the word which tribulation stems from, the Greek tribus, we see it means tribulation in all things. We shall study it later. We will see it together. I have called Pastor Josias here to help us with the reading of the scripture regarding today's topic. Our topic is judgments upon the flesh. We see God has many judgments. Judgments over the creative work, over creation. We see things happening to the sun, to the moon, to nature as a whole. The world is decaying. The work which was initiated and created in the book of Genesis, that work of creation shall end. We have been seeing the signs of this aging. Judgment against the geophysical world, earthquakes, natural disasters. The world lives a great catastrophe. It's a judgment, the beginning of one. We shall see the trumpets. On the fourth one, the church will be raptured. But there still will be a fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet, which will be sounded during the Great Tribulation. So let us position ourselves to understand what judgments are left between the rapture of the church and the establishment of the millennia. Jesus will take his church with the Holy Spirit. Jesus shall come for the saints. There will be the wedding of the Lamb. Then the church will return, not as a bride, but now as the wife. This is the establishment of the millennia. Jesus shall come and will be in Jerusalem. What is the great issue? Is the battle which will happen. The world wants Jerusalem. The owner of this world wants to sit upon the throne in Jerusalem. That is what the world wants to do. The world will be in one agreement. One man will govern everything. We will see this in every sphere, be it social, economical or political. And everything is being prepared for this very moment. The world will be governed by a single power, the government of the Antichrist. He shall establish his throne and he will say, I will do what Christ preached. I will bring pre a peace, bread, and freedom. However, these will be far from what Christ provided, for peace will be the peace of this world. The bread will be the bread that perishes, and the freedom will be the freedom that everybody wants to pursue their own desires. However, God has a plan, and His plan will not be undone. What will happen? Jesus will establish the millennia in Jerusalem. A great battle shall happen. Everything will be staged for this very moment. There will be a great battle to attempt to impede Jesus from establishing the millennia. But Jesus shall come. But for him to come, he needs to be the winner of this battle. This battle is seen in the book of Revelation and also in the book of Ezekiel. It is the battle of Armageddon. This word comes from two words. Ar, which means mountain in Hebrew, and Megiddo, which is a region which encompasses the valley of Jezreel, a valley which extends from the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, all the way to the Orient. Today, Israel has all his defenses there, for they know that the attacks shall come from there. It is a zone which is ripe for the concentration of troops, so they can tackle the dangers which come from the sea, land, and air. We see that the city of Megiddo receives its name from the fortress 
that Saul constructed to avoid the attacks against Israel. To defend against the attacks that either came from Jerusalem or from the north region. We see that this is used up into today. It is in this region where Israel has placed most of its heavy weapons to combat the enemies which try to traverse this region. So Megiddo, the fortress of Saul, here is on a mount, and below it is a valley, the valley of Jehoshaphat, or Jezreel. Today, it kind of looks like this. In these green pastures, this is where the troops will fight against Jerusalem. So we will see that here is the valley of Jezreel. And they shall concentrate here to attack Jerusalem. Because they will want the throne which lies in Jerusalem. Now why do they want that? The throne, this is a throne in which they want to govern the whole world. But the prophetic project is that Jerusalem will be administrated for a thousand years with the Messiah, which Israel will now recognize. They will say to themselves, there are so many attacks, what are we going to do now? They will say to each other that there is no other way out, that their only way, that their only salvation will be the Messiah. They will want to sacrifice. They will want to reconstruct the temple upon the mount in Jerusalem. Because if they do not reconstruct the temple, they will not be able to offer sacrifices. But we will see that when they try to offer sacrifices, the Messiah shall come. Because the Messiah will not allow any other sacrifice if not of His own. So, we are going to see how this will happen. Let us now read. I ask Pastor Josias to read the first couple texts. The first one in the book of Revelations, chapter 16, verse 16. And the Word of God says, And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Let's continue. Now, note that the banquet of God, this is not the supper of the Lamb, is a judgment over the flesh. This will be the divider of the project of God to establish the millennium. We will see a division between the faithful church and the unfaithful church, which is solely based on the work of creation. We will see this last judgment arising, giving way to the millennium. The Lord shows us that from flesh, nothing is salvaged. Let's continue. The book of Revelation, in chapter 16, verse 17 says, Then the seventh angel poured out his bow into the air, and a loud voice came from the temple of heaven, from the throne, saying, It is done. Brethren, you can see this is the Lord's vengeance, a judgment over flesh. Nothing is salvaged from flesh. The armies of 200 million soldiers will be ready to attack Jerusalem. They will be encamped in the valley of Jezreel. 200 million men awaiting to enter Jerusalem. This entrance will not be fought by rockets or weapons. For Jerusalem holds everything that is sacred to Muslims, Jews, and Christians. No one will attack Jerusalem with these weapons. All around it will be devastated. How will this fight, this battle be fought in Jerusalem? With short-range weapons. We are going to see this. Let's continue. In the book of Revelations, chapter 19, verse 18.
And the word of God says that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. So no one will escape, strong or weak. All will be under this judgment so that the millennia is established. This needs to happen. This will be a mass destruction of the flesh. Let's continue in Ezekiel. Let us see this prophecy in the Old Testament. It talks about the same thing. We see in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 39, verse 17. And the word of God says, And as for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, Speak to every sort of bird and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come. Gather together from all sides to my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you. A great sacrificial meal on the mountain of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. We see in this scripture a calling to all the birds in heaven, the same banquets we see in the book of Revelation. Let us see another text in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 39, verse 18. The word of God says, You shall eat the flesh of the mighty, drink the blood of the princesses, the prince of the earth, of rams and lambs, of goats and bulls, all of them fatlings of Bashan. You shall eat fat till you are full, and drink blood till you are drunk and my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you. The world shall see and then understand the sacrifice of Jesus. Man will see. He will understand when he sees the suffering, when God executes his judgment over the flesh. It shall be a cleansing for the millennia. First, the removal of flesh. Let us continue. Verse 20, 21, and 22. The Word of God says, You shall be filled at my table with horses and riders, with mighty men, with all the men of war, says the Lord God. I will set my glory among the nation, and all the nations shall see my judgment, which I have executed, and my hand, which I have laid on them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. So Israel will understand the judgment when they are beginning. The Messiah is here, the judgments too. Israel will awake, for they did not recognize the Messiah. They will think to themselves, we have nowhere to run or hide. And at that point, they will recognize and need the Messiah. We see in verse 23, it says, The Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquities. Brethren, it is important for us to see that the whole world shall see the hardship of Israel, will and has endured. The six million dead, the persecutions throughout all the world was because of this. And the word continues, because they were unfaithful to me. Therefore, I hid my face from them. I gave them into the hand of their enemies, and they fell by the sword. What is important for us is the following. Do not rebel against the Lord. For the flesh that rebels against the Lord, we see here, verse 28, Then they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who sent them into captivity among the nation, but also brought them back to their land and left none of them captive any longer. We see the key of David that opened the door and then closed. Those who did not accept it were dispersed. Verse 29 says, And I will not hide my face from them, them anymore, for I shall, be, shall have poured my spirit 
on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. For the Spirit has been outpoured over Israel upon the church. Can the brethren understand and see that there is no incoherency? These are judgments over the flesh. Let us continue. Let us see the prophecy. Chapter 38, verses 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog and the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Mizak, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Mizak, and Tubal. It is interesting for us to understand that the names mentioned here in the Word of God are actually regions of the Soviet Union. It is an ideology for the armies will be formed from ideologies. The ideology which communism formed. Now I ask you, is communism over? No, it's not. It actually has been disseminated throughout the whole world. The whole world shares this. An understanding of individual rights. For each one has its own rights and they feel entitled to so much. This, brethren, is the world which will have upon them the judgments that we just read. We will see that the Israelites will be the protagonists in this battle. They will have part in this. The church will be raptured. The church will not be here, for who will be here is Israel. Israel will have the responsibility of taking care of everything which is prophetic, which points to the Messiah. Jesus will come down and take his rightful throne in the presence of his church. Jesus shall return and claim what is his, the throne in Jerusalem. We see in the word of God, in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 4, the word of God says, I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Now, the following topic is vast. And the time is of the essence. And we have so much more to share. It would be prudent now if we were to look at the battle itself. How it will happen. A battle which will bring a judgment over the flesh. Let's see how it will come about. Let's see in the book, first, in First John, chapter 2, verse 15. The Word of God says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The love here is the Holy Spirit, and the world is the flesh. We see in verse 16, the Word of God says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Brethren, let us repeat this verse. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, this is not of the Father, but is of the world. So, let us see. What is John saying? The flesh, the eyes, the lust, or in other words, the form in which you see things. When you see things evilly, the sin is in your eyes. Or your tongue, when you speak illy of the brethren or the pastor or the work, the word says that the tongue will rot in your mouth. And those who will 
battle against Israel, this whole group, 200 million men, will be hit with this judgment. As you see, in this plague, it is prophesied in the judgment of God over the flesh. So, I tell you, pastor, Sunday school teacher, do not make use of the flesh to do this work. This work of the Spirit, what is from the Spirit is from the Spirit, what is from the flesh is from the flesh. If you use flesh, you will be here, judged in this word. We see the judgment over this army. And it will also be over those who do not take heed on what is going on today, which were not in the Spirit, who is in the Spirit will no longer be here. Then they will be able to speak freely. But if you are in this situation, oblivious to the moment or under this judgment, this is what will happen. Your tongue will rot. Brethren, Jesus will return with his saints. It will be the new Jerusalem. The wife will return with the Israel which accepted Jesus. Those who accepted Jesus will be raptured and shall return with Jesus, no longer as the bride, but now as the wife. Because for the Israel which accepted Jesus as the Messiah, they will be raptured. And they shall return with Jesus, now no longer as the bride, but now as the wife. We will see the continuation of the plague in the book of Zechariah. The book of Zechariah in, verse, in chapter 14, verse 1 says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming and your spoil will be divided in your midst. The enemies of Israel, the enemies of Jesus, on the day of the battle. Verse 2, For I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses riffled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. He has a project. Jerusalem will suffer a series of things. There will be no exit. For Israel, they do not have any weapons to fight against this multitude which will surround them. We see this when Jesus prophesies, but woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. It also states, those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. When Jesus was prophesying this, he was talking to the people of Israel. The people of Israel, and not the people who had a religion similar to Israel. We are going to see this in the book of Revelation where it says, people who deem to be Jewish and are not. We see in the word of God in verse 3 says, Then the Lord will go forth, and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of the battle. What was the day of the battle? When Joshua was in a battle against his enemies and the sun was setting. If the sun set, the enemies would regroup. What did Joshua do? He prayed. So the sun would retrocede and the moon would stop. The time stopped. If we stop and analyze time, we will see that there is a day missing in the gap of time. It is the day of Joshua. The text says it shall not be day or night. It will be a day known by all, nor darkness or light. 
a shadowy day until all enemies are defeated. This is the day of the battle. Verse 4 says, And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, west making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall be moved towards the north and half of it towards the south. If you study this, you will see that some mention that there will be a great earthquake. It is not a problem for us or a concern for us because we will not be here. Let us continue. Verse 5 says, Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake. In the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, thus the Lord God, my God will come, and all the saints with you. He shall return with the saints, the church. Look, look at this. He will win a battle against 200 million regardless of where they are. The whole world will offer, or all has already offered their armies. We don't know what countries, but many will be at the disposal of the enemies, so that enemies may attack Israel. The political aspects are not interesting for us, but these armies will enter Israel. These ties will be brought about by the countries going after treasures, oil, you name it. What does Israel have to offer in return? What would interest them? Nothing. Those around Israel have money, have oil, have many things which are far more interesting. As seen in the example of Saudi Arabia, or Iran, or other countries which are far greater powers and have much more to offer than Israel. What does Israel have to offer to gain allies? Maybe technology, but that's not enough. There will be a tension in this area. Let us remember the text seen in John 12. The lust of the eyes, of the tongue, Let's see the judgment over the flesh, the plague. Verse 12 says, And this shall be the plague in which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. Let's repeat the text in John. The lust of the eyes, of the mind, and the pride of life. All of this will rot. This plague will rot all of us. The battle will be won with this plague. Jesus will not come with weapons to fight this battle. This will all be defeated by this plague. Nothing from flesh will be worthy of salvaging. Do you know how long Israel will be burying the dead? Seven months. The flesh is not worthy of salvaging. In the text of Zechariah, we see that the world will be hit by this plague. The judgment will be over all the mounts and mountains so that you and everyone will see who is above all things, who is calling for this great banquet. The flesh will be destroyed and the millennia will be established. There will be more teachings on the subject. This will also be covered within our Biblical Institute 
and other classes in this day. These are the things that are soon to come. Let us not be caught off guard. I invite the church to stand at this moment. Yeah. 